Okay, today we're going to finish up this packet we started yesterday. Okay, uh, if I remember correctly, we got all the way to question number 10, but we did manage to skip one along the way. So if you would please come back to 7. For some reason, 7 was off the top of my screen, so I didn't see it, and nobody nobody pointed out that I missed it. Uh, 7 is talking about patterns. As it says, how are these patterns reflected in the table? Okay, so let's review what they're, what they're talking about with patterns. 5 said, what patterns do you observe? about the graphs. And six said, is the function increasing and decreasing and over, over which intervals? Okay, so mostly uh, the increasing and decreasing also goes a little bit hand in hand with the patterns that number five was talking about. Okay, so look back at it and let's, let's refresh our memories. Okay, what patterns did we say that the graph would have? Okay, well, one of the big things that we said was it was gonna be symmetrical. Okay, on either side of the line of symmetry. And we said as the graph approaches the line of symmetry, the, the points are going to get more uh, compacted. They're going to get more packed in and stuff like that. Okay, so that was kind of kind of the pattern that we could that we noticed. Uh, so seven wasn't really uh, really all that much. It was just asking about those same patterns in the table. Well, you can see the same stuff that we're saying about the, the line of symmetry, and you can see uh, the points getting closer packed together as it gets close to the line of symmetry. Very easy to see that stuff in the graph. Not quite as easy to see it in the table, but you can see it, okay? We can see the line of symmetry right across there, okay? Because we can, we can tell it's a line of symmetry because on either side of that line, and by side I mean above the line and below the line, you can see that it's, it's the same values, okay, as it approaches the line. If you take one step away from the line, 7.0, 7.0, another step away, 6.4, 6.4, another step, 5.4, 5.4. Okay, so you can see that symmetry in the table, but it's not quite as easy to see. You got to read the numbers and kind of think about it a little bit. Okay, and you can also see that the step size as you get away from the line of symmetry, okay, it's a small step there with just a 0 0.2 change, but as you get a little further away, 0.2 became 0.4. As you get a little further away, um, uh, 0.4 became 1.0. Okay, so we can see that as you get further and further away from the line of symmetry, the points start getting further scattered apart. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, we never did really address question number seven, but but that's it. <clears throat> How are these patterns reflected in the table? It's basically the same way, just by looking at the numbers, you can find the line of symmetry, you can find, uh, you can see that the points are getting further scattered. Okay, uh, 10 is where we left off. Use the table and the graphs to answer the following. Okay, guys, this is the easy part. If you can get through the chart and you can get through the graph or get that stuff built, then when they just start asking you questions about the chart and about the graph, that ought to be the easy stuff. Okay, that that's the, you know, just reading the numbers and answer the questions. Okay, approximately when will the diver <clears throat> enter the water? Okay, approximately when will the diver enter the water? Okay, well, we can use the chart, we can use the, uh, the graph, we can use anything that we've got to answer when is the diver going to enter the water. We'll have a look. When does the diver enter the water? Okay. Oh yeah, he hits hits the water right here. Yeah. Okay. This is this is him right there. Okay. So the question is, when is that? Okay. Well, you can do a couple of things. You can uh, figure out where that lines up on your x-axis. Okay. And if your graph isn't all that good, or maybe it's hard to tell, or whatever, we can also find where that happens in the chart, where the graph where the diver enters the water. Okay. And whether you're reading it out of the chart. Uh, or reading it out of the graph should be the same value, 2.0, 2.0. So how do we answer this question? Well, approximately when will the diver enter the water? 2.0 seconds, okay. But we kind of got to give it a little bit of framework, explain what it is that we're saying right there. 2.0 seconds what? <clears throat> 2.0 seconds, and, and say something like after he jumped. Okay, because 2.0 seconds is not really a time. It's an amount of time, okay? And in order to understand the amount of time, we have to know kind of when it started or when it's going to end or, or something. Okay, so saying 2.0 seconds after he jumped, well, that, that places that value in a specific time frame, okay? Uh, when is the diver at his highest point above the water? Highest point above the water. Okay, so let's have a look there. 
Okay. Should be easy to see in the graph, okay, where the highest point above the water is since we got height going on on our x-axis. Okay, there's the highest point. Also should be pretty easy to find that in the chart, highest point above the water, right there. So whether you are reading it in your graph or whether you're reading it straight out of your chart, either way, ought to be pretty easy to see that the uh, how uh, when is he at the highest point above the water? 0 0.8 seconds. That's an amount of time, so we got to kind of give people instructions on how to read it, 0 0.8 seconds. And again, after he jumped is, is a pretty, pretty easy explanation. Okay. On C, it asks, what does a negative Y value represent in this situation? Okay. Well, what kind of information was the Y value? What are, we what are we talking about on the y-axis? Say again? Yeah, or, or even simpler than that, height. Okay, height. Okay, well, the y-axis is representing his height. Okay, so what happens when his height goes negative? What, what happens in that part of the graph? He's below the water. Or underwater, however you want to put it. Okay, but that's what's happening. He was smart enough to jump into the water rather than jumping onto concrete. Okay, so he actually was able to hit the surface and then continue on below the surface. So he's underwater with a negative height. Okay, pretty straightforward there. 11, what is the y-intercept of this situation? Circle the y-intercept on your graph. Circle the coordinates of the y-intercept in the table. Okay, well, let's have a look at the graph. What is the y-intercept of the graph? And we'll get rid of some of this other junk I've put in the table. Where do you find a y-intercept? Yeah, on the y-axis. That's, that's I mean, in plain English, y-intercept means it intercepts the y-axis. It's not, not a confusing term. Pretty much tells you exactly what it's talking about. And obviously, it intercepts the y-axis there. Okay. Well, there has a coordinate. Okay. Well, there it is in the graph. Where is it in the uh, chart? Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. A y-intercept is always going to happen when x is 0. Okay, That's the only way to get onto the y-axis. x has to equal 0. Okay, So if you're looking at a chart and you want to know what's happening when you have a y-intercept, well, all you really need to know is which column is which. We've got x, we've got y's. Y-intercepts always happen when x is 0. So this is the coordinate. The first part of the question asks, where is the y-intercept? It is at 0, comma, 4. Okay, whether you're reading that out of the chart or reading that out of the table, should be pretty pretty easy to find. 0, comma, 4. Circle the y-intercept on your graph. I did. Circle the uh, coordinates of the y-intercept in the table. I did that too. Okay. <clears throat> Now, what does this point represent? Obviously, it represents the y-intercept. So I think what, they, what they're meaning to ask here is, in this little scenario about Diver Dan, or whatever his name was, jumping in the pool, okay, in, in, in terms of that setup, what does the y-intercept the y actually represent? Can we put it into words? Yeah, it's, it's the beginning of the problem, right? And that's the way a lot of the real world little setup problems that we deal with. The y-intercept is typically where the problem begins at, okay? So it's, it's usually a question of what's happening at the very beginning of the problem. So what does this point represent? Something to the effect of he is standing on the diving board. If I can write, which I'm not having a very good time at today. He is standing on the board. Diving board. And there's probably 10 different ways you can explain that, and they'd all be good. You know, he's standing on the diving board. He's not doing anything yet. He hasn't jumped yet. I mean, there's a, a lot of different ways to, to break it down in the English language. But that's what the y-intercept represents. This little experiment or whatever it is hasn't started yet. 
approximately when during the dive, does the distance from the water surface equal zero? In other words, when does the diver hit the surface of the water? This is one of the reasons I dislike sea scope. Haven't we already answered this question? Did we not determine what how long it went by before he hit the water? What did we say? Yeah, 2.0 seconds. Approximately when will the diver enter the water? 2.0 uh, seconds. Now they're asking, when does the diver hit the surface of the water? Well, duh, you've already asked us that. We've already answered it, so leave us alone. 2.0 seconds. Okay. Where is this point located on the scatter plot? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure they already made a circle it. Okay, it's already circled right there. Okay, so uh, where's the point located on the scatter plot? We've already got it circled. Is it on one of the axes? Well, there's the one of the duh questions of all time. Okay. He hit an axis. In this case, the axis represented the surface of the water. So, yeah, I mean, is it on one of the axes? Yes, it is. Which axis is it? Is it X? Is it Y? What is it? It's the X axis, right? X is always the horizontal axis. Y is always the vertical axis. So coming back to their uh, simple little questions. Is it on one of the axes? Yes, it is. If so, which one? It's on the X. What are the approximate coordinates of this point? Well... <laughs> I've already asked them to stop asking us this question. Okay, we already figured out that 2.0 seconds went by. Okay, so that's the X value. The question is now what kind of a Y value would put you on the X axis? Well, it's really quite simple. What type of a value did it take vertically in order for him to enter the water? It took a zero, didn't it? After two seconds, his height is zero. That's how come he's wet right now. Okay, he hit the water. So 2.0 seconds, zero. And that is a characteristic of any time you want to hit the x-axis. Just like any time you want to hit the y-axis, x has to be zero. Any time you want to hit the y or the x-axis, y has to be zero. Okay, that's simply the way it goes. Thank you. Okay, simply the way it goes. To hit the y-axis, x has to be 0. To hit the uh, x-axis, y has to be 0. Okay. All right, well, I just gave away question number 16. Okay, what is the value of y for any point on the x-axis? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, y must be 0. Okay, so that's a, that was a gimme. 17, if the point at which the graph crosses the y-axis is called the y-intercept, what do you think the point at which... The, oh, my gosh. What? <laughs> now they're just wasting our time. Now, x-intercept is a term we don't hear a whole lot about, and you won't hear a whole lot about it. Okay? Um, as you, What you'll find is as you go higher and higher in mathematics... Okay, uh, we pay more attention to the x-axis than we pay attention to the y-axis, which is to say that we're very interested in what the independent variable is doing. Now, all we usually use the y-axis for is to look at a graph and say, hey, when x is doing this, where's y at? Okay, we look at the independent axis, and then we look at the dependent variable. Okay, so it's all about x, and then we just measure y. So uh, we're more concerned about things like y-intercepts than we are in x-intercepts. But in the discussions that we're going to have for the next couple of weeks about quadratic functions, uh, you are going to be talking a little bit about x-intercepts more so than you probably already have or ever have. And uh, what you will uh, figure out is that you, you will have, you know, the possibility that a graph will hit an x-axis once, or a graph will hit an x-axis twice, or the graph may not even hit the x-axis at all. And those three different categories will mean something different to uh, those equations. But we'll get to all that. Find and circle the x-intercepts on your graph. Find and circle the coordinates of the x-intercepts on your table. Well, unless I'm losing my mind, we have already done this. Circle the x-intercepts. Okay. Leave us alone. It's circled. Okay. There's your x-intercept. Now, like I said, it is possible that a graph might have more than one x-intercept, 
Okay, uh, we're going to see other parabolas that won't be cut off like this one is because it'll be a different type of a situation, different type of a problem, in which case we'll, we may end up with another x-intercept on the other side. But for this problem, there was only one. We've got it circled. It also said to circle it in the table. Well, there you go. Okay, there's your x-axis intercept. Okay, so we did that. If a relationship has an x-intercept, what number has to be one of the y values in the range? Well, I think they're badgering us now, kind of asking us the same questions over and over again, but they did ask this one a little bit differently, so let's take a peek at this. If a relationship has an x-intercept, okay, well, what does it mean again, x-intercept? Means it hits the x-axis, right? How does something hit the x-axis? What has to happen for something to hit the x-axis? Y has to be zero, right? That's the property. Okay, so in order to hit the x-axis, whatever's going on, y is zero right there. Okay, then the problem, okay, the rest of this question asks, what number has to be one of the y values in the range? Well, we talked about that word yesterday. What's range mean? It's the y value, okay? Range is all of the possible y values, okay? So the question is asking, as silly as this is, in order to hit the x-axis, which means y must be 0, what value has to be one of the y values in the range? So the question is saying, okay, if y has to be 0, then what is y? 0. Okay, and that's that's just it. When you're looking at when you're looking at an equation or a graph or a chart, if you want to know if you're going to have an x-axis intercept, we're going to be looking in the range to see if you have a zero somewhere. If you have a zero for y, well, that that is going to make the graph hit the x-axis. So there you go. That's an x-axis intercept. Uh, number 20 here. Finally, draw a picture or write something that will help you remember the difference between the x-intercept and the y-intercept. Uh, C-Scope is real big on these things, you know, kind of asking you to invent some way that you are going to remember. How are you going to remember the difference between x-intercept and y-intercept? What has to happen to have an x-intercept or a y-intercept? Stuff like that. And uh, I, I won't make you come up with that. You can come up with anything that will help you remember it. Uh, I've got some silly little things that help me remember stuff, kind of like I shared with you yesterday. Remember how I, I remember the difference between domain and range? Remember how I said you do it? Alphabetically, right? D comes before R in the alphabet. X comes before Y in the alphabet. D goes with X. Y goes with R because they both come first. They both come last. Okay. Now, the only thing I can offer you on this is, uh, okay, two things we're looking to remember, X-intercept, Y-intercept. In order to cross an x-axis, if we're interested in crossing the x-axis, that means we are interested in what x is. And that's all we're really interested in. We want to know where on the x-axis is it. Okay, so that kind of to me says, you know what? If you want to know where you're crossing the x-axis, the only thing we're worried about is x. Okay, if you want to know where you're crossing the y-axis, the only thing you're interested in is y. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about it, and that goes hand in hand with a, a little bit of a different type of an explanation. For an x-intercept, if you're only interested in an x, do you need a y? You don't need a y. So that is how come y is zero. We don't need a y for an x-intercept. We just need to know what the x is. Same thing for a y-intercept. We only need the y. Does that mean you need an x? No. Okay, so that's kind of unfortunately, it's a little, it seems like it's a little bit backwards. To find an x-intercept, let y be zero. To find a y-intercept, let x be zero. And people get it a little confused because it seems like it's a little backwards, but just think about it. x-intercept means x only. It's the only value that you need. If you only need an x, the y's got to be nothing. Okay, if you only need a y, then the x has got to be nothing. Okay, but again, if you can come up with some cutesy little way like, you know, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, some little acronym or something like that, or anagram, uh, whatever works for you, that's fine. Okay, but anyway, so that's the end of that. 
Okay. And uh, we did spend a couple of days going through this. Um, it's, you know, we've got some new things we're going to have to start looking at and thinking about. So I kind of wanted to spend some time with you going over some of these little properties. Uh, on Monday, we'll look at something uh, different, start turning you loose, letting you work some things on your own. But that's it for today. And there's no homework.